Well, good morning, church. And as Greg hinted at, uh, I wanted to say a special thank you to the church, this church family. Um, Fred and Linda Shirk really wanted to uh, have the service here and have the visitation here, and they didn't want uh, to have to go through a funeral home and pay for all of that. Uh, and instead, they just asked the church to help out. And you did a marvelous, marvelous job. Thank you to all of you who showed up for the funeral, who were able to come to the visitation. For those of you who helped by ushering or by helping prepare the food or serve that, it was a great gift. Uh, your encouragement for, for uh, Linda and for the family was marvelous. And I just want to commend you all very much and thank you for that. It was, it was a great demonstration of the love of God through his people, and, and I'm, I was very proud of you, so good, good on you. Look at, look at somebody next to you and just say, we, we did okay, we did okay. Yeah. So we're in the first of uh, three series of sermons now uh, that are all connected by this idea of rebuilding community, and the lens we're using for this idea of rebuilding community is the picture of the Jews who were returning from exile in Babylon to their land back around the year 538 B.C., over about the next hundred years. So the first of these series is all about worship. We're recalling that the very first step for the Jews when they returned was to reestablish the worship of God by rebuilding the temple. God insisted that their first priority needed to be the restoration of worship, not the rebuilding of their social lives, not getting their businesses in order, not getting their farms replanted and the, the sheep re flock rebuilt, not fixing up their houses, but restoring worship to the place of highest priority. It was only when they acknowledged God and built everything in their lives on Him that life was going to work the way it was intended to work. We saw that the act of worship was fundamentally about declaring God's worthiness, that He is worthy has ultimate value about recognizing, voicing our understanding that as our Creator and as our Redeemer, Jesus Christ was worthy of our devotion, was worthy of our praise, worthy of our entire lives. That we were created to worship. Remember, we were created to worship, so therefore we are going to worship. We're going to worship someone or something. And so we choose to worship the living God. And we choose to worship God instead of pursuing money or power or fame or other persons or ourselves. We worship God as He's revealed to us in Jesus Christ, blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, not the God of our own imaginations or our own making. I also noted last week that one of the benefits of worship is that it helps us, it corrects our perspective. Because when we worship, when we set our minds and our hearts on the things of God, when we enter into His presence, as I prayed earlier, He reveals Himself to us. God is going to speak to you in worship, and you need to start training yourself to listen because He's going to be talking to you during worship. He's going to reveal Himself to you. He's going to enable you to see things through His eyes, from His vantage point, to get above the noise, to get above the distractions, above all the stuff that's going on around us, to see what's really the case, what is really going on, and what you need to be paying attention to. Because worship is our response the proper response of those who are created to the one who created us. So today, I want to explore a little bit more about this response of worship. I want to share a little more of the why we do this thing we call worship. So this is the key point for today. Worship is our act of responding to the mercy of God. And Paul makes this very clear in the passage in Romans that Vanna just read for us in chapters 12, chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And the context of that passage makes it even clearer. If you want to go back this afternoon and look at the few, a few paragraphs right before chapter 12, you'll see Paul's coming to the conclusion of an argument that he's been building for 12 or 11 chapters. He's been laying out the gospel for the church in Rome throughout the first part of this letter. In chapters 9 through 11, he's been focusing on one of the crucial questions that was causing problems for the church, confounding the church. What was this whole deal about including Gentiles? How did we get to this point of letting them come into the church, which up to then, the people of God had been only Jews? How's that going to work? How can that be, happen? And Paul is answering this question, particularly in chapters 9 to 11, 
an answer that was given him by the Holy Spirit after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, that God had decided to have mercy on the Gentiles too. That God had shut everyone up in disobedience, he said. Jew and Gentile were all under sin, so that God could have mercy on everyone. That both Gentile and Jew could be mercied, could be shown mercy. Both of them who were guilty could be justified by grace by placing their faith in Christ. Everyone needed mercy, and everyone was going to be given the opportunity to receive mercy. God was going to be merciful to both Gentiles and Jews, and he wasn't going to require Gentiles to convert to Judaism, and he wasn't going to show a distinction between them. With all that in mind, Paul says, with this understanding that God has made a way for sinners to be reconciled to God, to be fully forgiven, to be justified, to be given a new heart and a new life through the power of the Spirit, and all of that because of his mercy, Paul says your response to all of that is to worship. That's a big part of why we worship. But as it happens, that's not a new idea. Paul is not saying something that has never been said before. He, if we look back in Psalm 40, we see this pictured really, really well. So let's look at Psalm 40 to see how this fits with the biblical picture of life with God and what that ought to look like. In the first two verses, David's prayer starts out with this desperate situation. He is feeling something that is threatening his well-being. It's threatening his very life. He feels like he's in a pit, like he's trapped in, in something. He's stuck. He's vulnerable to attack. He is absolutely in danger of losing his life. Now, he doesn't tell us how he got there. How he arrived in this pit-like situation isn't said. He doesn't say, well, this was my fault. I did something, and so I'm in this precarious situation because of things that I've done. He doesn't tell us, no, I, I was completely innocent. Other people have caused this problem to happen, but I'm here anyway, and all of this happening to me, and I'm stuck. But he's been there for some time. He says, I waited patiently. I, some time has passed. He's been waiting for God to answer him. Another translation says he's been waiting intently. In other words, the situation has gone from being mildly inconvenient to sort of problematic to really dangerous, and his sense of urgency has increased proportionately. He's getting desperate, desperate enough to cry out to God for help. And remember, this is a seasoned, skilled warrior. He's not just a babe in the woods. So the situation was desperate. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that desperate situation where despite your best efforts or maybe because of your own failings, you now face absolutely certain calamity? When I was a kid, I used to love watching Tarzan movies, uh, especially with my uncle. And, and I loved the ones with Johnny Weismuller in, as Tarzan in particular. And one of the scenes that I remember very, very vividly was the quicksand scene. And, and it apparently was a staple in lots of movies in the 30s and 40s. But every movie seemed like it had a quicksand scene. Usually it's one of the bad guys who falls into the quicksand and he starts to struggle as, it's, as he starts to sink. And with each passing moment, he sinks deeper and deeper into the quicksand until finally he's swallowed up and died. That's the picture of Psalm 40. It's desperate. David feels like he's stuck in quicksand and he's about to sink. And the mud and the mire at the bottom of the pit have grabbed a hold of him and are dragging him under the waters. Now, I can relate to this just a little bit. I remember baptizing a guy in a cow pond here in Kansas. And we went into that thing, and we're down in mud up to our knees. And four shoes went down, and three shoes came back up. And, and, and it, I wasn't sure we were going to make it back out after I dunked him and brought him back up. I mean, I said the words, raise again a newness in life in Christ. And, and it's like, I hope, I hope that's real, because I feel pretty stuck. But we would, in fact, we used to use this psalm a lot in baptisms, because we did a lot of baptisms in those days in Potter's Pond. And it was a great illustration, a vivid life illustration. This mire and muck that has been your life, that's all down there. But we're raising you back up. And when they got back up, they got to walk on the little concrete path there right by the, the, the north side of that. And like, yes, I was in muck. Now I'm, my feet are put on a solid place. Well, sometimes in the Tarzan movies, 
The person who fell in was the leading lady, you know, the, one of the good guys. Or so. And Tarzan would grab a vine or a branch and extend that to them to pull them out. Sometimes he would even dive in and grab them and pull them and drag himself both out. That's what David experienced. God is rescuing him from certain death, pulled him out of a hopeless situation, set him in a secure place. And instead of sinking helplessly to his doom, God had brought him up out of that miry clay and was putting his feet on solid rock. So he's no longer on this slippery path, no longer constantly tripping up, no longer constant danger of falling where the, where the situation is rapidly leading to destruction. He's, he's tr not trapped. He's free. And he can walk confidently toward this good life. He's on solid ground with solid footing underneath him. Instead of feeling like the guy sitting on the board at the dunk tank, you feel like the person who's throwing the ball, okay? It's a picture of safety and security. He's, his feet are set. He's not waiting for this thing to fall out from underneath him. It's the opposite of being in the pit, that chaotic, unsure, shaky living where you're expecting everything to just collapse at any moment. Now, I can't count the number of times in my life when I've experienced God saving me out of those kind of situations where I looked hopeless, I've been on the receiving end of God's mercy. Sometimes it was something where I got myself into another fine mess. Thank you. A right. little shout out there to Laurel and Stan and Ollie. But sometimes it wasn't any of my doing at all. It was, it, I was looking like I'm going to have to pay for somebody else's sin, but God still rescued me. More importantly, I recognize that God rec rescued me from absolute certain destruction, eternal destruction, when he rescued me by sending Jesus to the cross to pull me out of the quicksand of my sin. Do you know that? Do you absolutely know that? And does that matter to you today? I hope so. I believe so. But here's another question. How do you react when you've been rescued? What do you do when the pressure has been relieved. You were crying out to God because you felt like you were sinking forever. The pressure was growing. Your demise is imminent. Someone was going to find out about what you had done. Someone was going to expose you. Someone was going to catch you in the act. Or maybe the bills for your spending spree were coming due. Or your failure to take your vows and your spouse seriously were about to cause the collapse of your marriage. You were a goner. And then God swooped in like Johnny Weismuller and pulled you out of the mess you'd fallen into. How do you respond to that? We're a long way from the two world wars of the 20th century, but I expect that most of you here have heard the expression foxhole religion. Have you heard that? Or maybe the, you've seen it in this way, there aren't any atheists in foxholes. Maybe you've heard that. Foxholes are places that soldiers dig to crawl into, to take up a defensive position in the face of enemy fire. And foxholes are dangerous places. Because in foxholes, it's real common for men to make all kinds of promises to God. To pray fervently, even if they've never prayed before in their lives. Well, the truth is, you can find foxholes in all kinds of places today. You can find them, you can find yourself in a foxhole, some place where your worst nightmare is an ever-present possibility that's threatening to become reality at any moment. You can find yourself in a foxhole at work when the boss suddenly stops by, stops by and says, I need to see you right away in my office. Or when you're sitting in the doctor's office and you notice that she's not smiling. Or when the phone rings in the middle of the night, and the voice on the other side is the highway patrol. You can find yourself in a foxhole pretty quickly. And there are lots of people who will call out to God, will cry out for mercy when they're in a foxhole, when they're up to their neck in quicksand. And by the way, God's not embarrassed by that. God's not too big and high and mighty. He, he doesn't mind getting messy to save people. He's already endured the indignity and the torture of a crucifixion. He's not above coming to your rescue and getting into the quicksand with you. You need to know that. But the real question is, was the cry for help sincere? 
Did you realize that you needed mercy and saving, not just out of the immediate pain, but from the whole life that brought you to that foxhole, from the whole life that led you into the quicksand? Jesus once was met by ten lepers. He was on his way somewhere. They came. They were suffering from this horrible disease and from the social ostracism that came with that disease. They were outcasts. They were living a hellish existence on the fringes of society. And so they came and they cried out to Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus sent them on their way to report to the priests to be certified that they were in fact healed. And on the way there, they were all ten healed. Nine of the ten continued on their way and never looked back. One, a Samaritan, came back and with loud cries fell at the feet of Jesus and began to cry out and thank him for healing him and to praise God. Once the pressure and the immediate pain of that rescued need for rescue, once that's all gone, it is so very easy to just murmur a quick thanks, sort of aim it at the sky in general, and go right back to the pig pen. Go right back to the self-centered, self-seeking life you were living before. Oh, you know, you might tweak a few things, make a few tweaks in behavior, maybe give an extra dollar in the, in the pot or, or come to church a few more times a year. But nothing's really changed. Nothing's really changed. You never responded to the gift of God's mercy. You just took advantage of the help and assumed that you were still in charge of your life. You were still at the center of the world. You think of God as your fixer. The guy you can go to when you get into another fine mess and you need someone to clean up after you. But David responded differently. First of all, he responded with a song of praise, verse 3. He responds by praising God in song for rescuing him. Because praising God with a fervent song for rescuing you is the proper response. Did you know the world even knows this? The church hasn't always figured it out, but the world knows it. How do I know that? Because soccer hooligans will chant louder when the goal scores and keeps their team from losing to their rivals. And they'll just go nuts with a fervent chant and song. The KU fight song and the rock chalk chant have more energy when the team scores and builds themselves, comes back to win. And the fans are more fervent in their rock chalk chant or whatever lame excuse you have for a fight song at your school. <clears throat> Sorry, just that little, just that kind of came out right there. I'm looking at you, Sherry. Um, sorry. <laughs> Now I'm embarrassed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> David sang a song of praise. And his response demonstrates a bunch of things, four things. It shows, if you respond with praise, it shows that you recognize you needed rescuing. You acknowledge that your life wasn't right. You were in sin. You weren't going to be able to save yourself. Secondly, it shows that you're acknowledging it was God who rescued me. It wasn't luck. It wasn't fate. It wasn't just a happy turn of events. It wasn't an, well, everything eventually works out kind of moment. No. It wasn't happy American optimism. It was God who saved me, God who rescued me, God who rescued you. Your Savior has a name. You're not just giving a religious name to luck. Right? God rescued me. Thirdly, it shows that you acknowledge that God showed you mercy, that he rescued you when you didn't deserve rescuing, because that's what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy is when you get the warning instead of the ticket. Mercy is when your spouse gives you another chance to make it right instead of leaving you. Mercy is when your friend comes and pays the fine so you don't go to jail or pays your mortgage payment so you don't lose the house. Or when Jesus pays the price for your sin so you can go free and be reconciled to God. That's mercy. And it shows that you recognize that I need to express gratitude. Because genuine gratitude always comes out. It never stays hidden. 
Gratitude can't stay unspoken or unacknowledged. It is in the very nature of gratitude, it'll find a way to express itself. And praise is the way we were created to respond when we need to say thank you for mercy. It's what was built into us. Well, secondly, David responded with testimony. Five times in verses 9 and 10, David announces that he has testified to what God did for him. And he insists he hasn't hidden this testimony in his heart. He hasn't withheld the story of what God did for him from the people of God. He has spread the news often and loudly telling everyone what God has done. I have a problem with people who won't talk about their faith openly. I'm sorry, I, just, I do. When I try to talk to someone about their faith, and they say back to me, <clears throat> well, my, my faith's a private matter. I don't, I don't like to talk about that. My spiritual radar just starts spinning, okay? I, I understand that people can be nervous around pastors. It, it's, it's sort of an occupational hazard. I get that, okay? And, and I understand why, why someone wouldn't want to get involved, open themselves up to some onslaught of, of religious arm twisting or, or, or religious arguments or something. I don't like that myself. And I can understand introverts because, believe it or not, I am one. But if you're not willing to talk about your faith, I start to wonder if you have any, anything that's real anyway. If you got something different than self-made religion. Because if you've received the mercy of God, if you understand that Jesus Christ rescued you from your own stupid, self-centered, rebellious way of life that was hurting you and hurting those around you and earning you a fast ticket to eternal damnation, if you've understood all that, how can you not say something? I mean, it might come out all wrong, but you're still going to say something. For mercy's sake, something's going to come out that expresses your gratitude to God for saving you from hell and from your own twisted perversity and pride. Remember that I said that worship gives you a chance to have a different perspective, to get God's perspective? Verses 9 and 10 demonstrate that really well. Because the things that David says he is proclaiming to the people of God they all reflect a changed perspective. He, he's telling them this because he stepped into the place of God and he sees from a different lens, through a different lens. He sees from a different place now. He's, he's seeing a lens that puts his fall into the quicksand and God's rescue in completely different light because he's interpreting his life now through the filters of God's salvation, the filters of God's faithfulness, his compassion and loving kindness, his truth and his righteousness because the character of God is the proper prism for measuring what his life ought to reflect. David said, he put my feet on a solid place. He put a new song in my mouth. And many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Well, how's that going to happen? How's it going to happen for other people to put their trust in the Lord and see? Well, there's two key things. Number one. You have to tell them what Jesus did for you. The proper response to receiving God's mercy is to tell someone else how you can get some too. I mean, let's just be, let's just be real about this. For goodness sake, we post the news about what we ate for lunch on face chat gram things. You know, so thousands of people can be envious and then we'll take a mass email. You know, you find out, oh, there's a, there's a, a coupon for a free Dairy Queen blizzard, and we'll fast, we'll mail that to everybody on our contact list. By the way, if you find one of those, make sure I'm on your contact list. Because if you've received the gift of God's mercy, you ought to be like David. He's telling everyone. I mean, he wrote a psalm. But the second thing is crucial. Because if you're going to tell people about your testimony, about what God's done to rescue you, to impact others, to lead them to trust in the Lord, they have to see something. They have to see a changed life. The only way they're going to come to trust in the Lord is if they, they can see that your life starts to look like someone who has been shown mercy and changed as a result. Because you might talk a lot about how God brought you out of the quicksand and out of the muck and the mire, but if they've been listening and watching you for a few months or a few years, 
As far as they can see, you're still pretty much covered in muck and smell like the pit, and they see that, in fact, you keep jumping into that pit pretty regularly. They're not going to conclude that God is an option for helping them out of their pit. They're going to conclude that you're either a liar or a fool. They're not about to try what you're recommending. But on the other hand, if you are different, if there's something different about you, they'll notice. And they'll ask and they'll wonder why. Now think about it. Think, th imagine one of those fake reality TV shows with the makeover things, right? You understand that those are dramatized fake things, right? Imagine that they've gone back. They have, imagine that has a sequel or a final scene, you know, six months later after the real... Uh, the dr tearful, dramatic reveal with all of the squeals and the hugs and the emotional uh, declarations, how this is going to change their lives forever. And they come back six months later and the dream home is trashed and looks like a dump. Or, or the guy who lost 160 pounds and vowed he was going to stay on his diet and exercise plan and he's now regained 200 pounds and sits on the couch all day eating junk food. No one who sees that sequel is going to conclude that those declarations and the promises that were made in that emotional moment of rescue meant anything at all. See, if we're going to see people deciding to put their trust in the Lord, it'll be because we look like people whose lives are different, whose lives are better because we've received mercy, and they'll be able to see that. They'll be able to see something. Because, see, they've seen you in the pit, and now they see you standing on solid ground instead of sinking, yeah, there's probably still some muck left. There's probably still an aroma that isn't everything you want it to be. But there's going to be tangible differences. And then we can tell them about the mercy we received. Third thing David did, he responded by surrendering his life to God. We sang a little bit about it today. Because that changed life that's going to de demonstrate the reality of your rescue, the, the tangibly different life that is going to give credibility to your testimony that isn't something that you construct out of your best efforts to be gooder. It's found by surrendering to God. Verses 6 to 8, David says some really powerful truths. He says, God doesn't need your sacrifices. Now, David knew that the sacrifices were required by the law. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But he's, talk, he, he's, he's seeing something that's deeper, that something that the sacrifices are pointing to, the, the fact that God doesn't need your self-serving attempts to appear righteous or religious. He, he needs your surrender so he can change you. David says, I delight to do your will. Folks, that's the mark of someone who's responded to mercy. Someone who's recognized that the only way I'm going to get better is to give up, let God make me all over again. Before, I, I delighted to do my will. I wanted to pursue whatever I thought would make me happy or rich or famous or, or satisfied or whatever. And now I want to do what pleases God and brings praise to Him. Before, the only law I obeyed was whatever I thought I wanted to do, whatever I approved of, or what I thought the people around me told me I should do, or whatever I did to escape from punishment. But now the law of God and the Word of God are governing my life. It's being written on my heart. It's the determining thing in my life, not just my... Sunday mornings. Finally, David responded by embracing a life of living in dependence upon God. This, this could be a whole thing in itself. I just, I just want to say it's, it's important to understand that because you've received mercy, God's not saying, well, that's the only shot you get. Now it's up to you, so buck up, buckaroo. No, I respond to God's mercy and I realize I'm going to need this the rest of my life. It's been a heart transplant, right? And I need the new anti-rejection medication of the Spirit of God in my life for that new heart to keep functioning. I, I need to continually depend upon God's mercy. I'm not saying that I, I'm someone who just kind of runs through life chronically getting into messes and expecting God to clean up after me like he's my fixer, or I, I'm, I sort of flit through life and I don't pay any attention, I just make a bunch of messes and expect somebody else to clean up after me. That's not what David's saying, but he is saying, I'm dependent upon God continuing to rescue me over and over and over and over again. Not because I'm trying to be a screw-up all the time, but just because by the nature of the case, I need rescuing. 
And living in dependence on God's mercy means I know that, but I also know that God loves rescuing me. He's not bothered when he has to help me. He isn't disgusted with you for failing. He loves you. So I trust his love. I don't try to earn it. I just enjoy it. And I reciprocate with love and thanksgiving. Depending on God's mercy means I refuse to pretend that I'm okay when I'm not. I'm trusting in his mercy. It also means I'm refusing to justify or ignore my sin as if it doesn't matter. I live as someone, as Paul said to Timothy, be strong in grace. Be strong in desperately needing God. Because you see, there's a difference between being rescued and being someone who's been rescued and knows I have no life apart from my rescuer. I am tied to him forever now. There's a difference between the nine lepers and the one who came back. You can be like the nine. You can be healed or rescued or delivered and never recognize the mercy of God. You just ask for help and chalk it up to, well, somebody up there must like me. And you go on your way. You keep living your life. You're still at the center and you never come back to surrender, to worship, to say thank you to the one who made it all possible. Because in your mind, it's really all still all about you. Or you can be like David in the one leper. You can recognize the unfathomable depth of the mercy of God that pulled you out of the muck, put your feet on a path, gave you a hope and a life. And so you say, I'm tied to him forever. And I choose to remember. And I choose to depend on his mercy. And I respond with praise and thanksgiving to the one who had mercy on me.